Hello, hello, everybody. Great to see you all. Um, as Julie said, I'm Arthur, Arthur Davis. I've been working at Rich Earth for a number of years here and um, excited to uh, get to be a part of this today. Um, so um, also, as Julie said, this next uh, little section of presentations is gonna be about processing technology um, and specifically about contamination removal. So uh, our, first, um, our first presentation is gonna be from Aurea Hauser. Uh, who'll be presenting on the influence of organics removal on pharmaceutical absorption. Uh, Aurea is a PhD student at ETH Zurich, Switzerland, and is working at the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology, AVAG, in the group of Kai Udert. Her research focuses on the treatment of urine to produce the fertilizer RN developed by Vuna, focusing on optimizing the performance of the nitrification in the adsorption of pharmaceuticals. Of pharmaceuticals. Um, Aurea, if you're ready to go, uh, you can share your screen and unmute yourself. Thank you. So hello, everyone. I'm very happy to open this uh, tech research session today. And I'm, I'm going to show you a bit what we found recently here at AVOG about the, the influence of uh, organics removal on pharmaceutical adsorption by activated carbon. And as I'm the first one of this session, I want to give a, a really quick introduction on the topic, let's say. And so we all do know, how can I go forward here? There we go. Okay, so we do know that pharmaceuticals um, in the environment is an emerging issue for quite some time. And we also do know that quite a big fraction of the pharmaceuticals actually enter the waste stream or the environment finally via um, urine excretion, um, which has been published by Leonard et al. already quite some time ago. So it is just um, obvious, let's say, that we do need some kind of barrier here to make sure that pharmaceuticals are not entering um, the environment. There are like two, the two most common ways of treating pharmaceuticals from waste streams, one being the ozonation, um, which has been shown already that is not very appropriate to be used on urine directly as we do have a lot of bulk organics in urine which then require a lot of ozone and there is a lot of energy um, to remove pharmaceuticals and also unwanted side products can be produced. The other common way to remove pharmaceuticals from waste streams is adsorption on activated carbon. And this has been looked at by Köping et al. for urine specifically, but for nitrified urine. And she um, was able to show that it is very uh, successful to treat pharmaceuticals from nitrified urine using a granular activated carbon column. But this, of course, includes this previous step of nitrification, which is maintenance and energy intense. And so we asked ourselves, OK, can we also use the granular activated carbon directly to remove pharmaceuticals from untreated urine to have an easier treatment chain, let's say. And having this question in mind, we came up with the following hypothesis. We hypothesized that the organics removal and somehow is required to then absorb the pharmaceuticals from the stored or untreated urine. And this is due to or we hypothesize at least that this is due to two main reasons. One is the competition with the, orga the bulk organics in the urine, which then leads to just extremely high carbon requirement to remove pharmaceuticals. And the other one is um, an operational issue that it would lead to extensive biomass growth in the filter itself, and which then leads to, to clogging of the filter. And to address those um, points we set up, uh, oh no, first, so yes, we hypothesize an organics removal, but of course, then the question pops up, yeah, okay, organics removal is fine, but then to what extent, right? I mean, if we have to remove everything, of course, then we also remove pharmaceuticals already there. Um, so yeah, let me come now to the, to the method or the first experiment that we conducted, which we did using powdered activated carbon. So we grinded the granular activated carbon to a powder and used filtered urine to really just see 
the effect of adsorption only, and we use three different urines. One being the stored urine, I referred to it before also as the untreated urine, which is not perfectly true because the anaerobic storage of the collection already has um, in, like comes with a few changes. So the urea is all already hydrolyzed and most of the organics are fermented. So it is mainly in the form of, of acetate, for example, so uh, volatile fatty acids. The second urine that we looked at is after an aerobic pretreatment for the organics, but with a very short hydraulic retention time of only one to two days. But this is enough to already remove about 75% of the organic organics, which it's not like sharp 75%, it's rather a range of 70 to 80%, depending on the incoming urine. And then the third one is with a longer aerobic treatment of about three to five hydro, um, days of hydraulic retention time, which then is kind of comparable to nitrified urine that Köping et al. already showed that it should work, where we have an organics removal of like 80 to 90%, and here referred to as the 85% organics removal. So we took those three differently treated urines, we filtered it, and we added 21 different substances, being pharmaceuticals and artificial sweeteners, all very abundant in urine, at very or rather high concentrations of 200 micrograms per liter to also then really be able to detect the removal. And we applied 16 different um, carbon concentrations to then be able to evaluate the carbon usage rate for a certain removal. Um, here is an example, the 90% removal. And the carbon usage rate now really expresses the amount of carbon we need to treat a liter of urine. So let's dive in the results that we found. What you can see here now is on the y-axis, this carbon usage rate for the 90% removal in a logarithmic scale. You see it for the three different urines and for the 21 different pharmaceuticals. I, I want to like to make my point zoom in to one example, but it's true for, for basically all of the pharmaceuticals. So let's just zoom into lidocaine here and think about what you see. So first the blue bar is stored urine. We have full organics in there. And then we remove 75% and there is no change in carbon requirement at all. And then we remove an additional 10% and we save a lot of carbon. This was quite surprising to us. And so we wanted to understand why, why is this? Why don't we see the same pattern as in organics when it comes to carbon requirements? So we looked at the, the carbon more in detail. Here again, you see the lidocaine. And we know from literature here in the, in the red box that the low molecular weight organic fraction of the organics is actually the fraction that is um, competing for adsorption sites on, on, on activated carbon with pharmaceuticals. And so we did an analysis of our urines to see what carbon fractions do we have. And we see it in the left graph. So we have on the y-axis the organics concentration, but now in the different fractions. And the big part in stored urine, in untreated urine, is actually this low molecular weight organics, which suppose should actually compete for pharmaceuticals, but this we can't see in, in our data. I mentioned in the very beginning that we also do know that in stored urine, we do have a lot of volatile fatty acids, such as acetate and propionate. So we measured them and we found that about 40% of the total organic in stored urine, here highlighted in, in the green box again, is acetate and propionate. We also found well, we know that it is quite easily biodegradable. That is also why it is all removed in this, let's say, easy organic treatment step where we have the 75% organics removal. And with an additional experiment, we also could show that the acetate and propionate both do not absorb at all on carbon. So they are not contributing to any competition there. And this, explains now why we do not see a difference between stored urine and 75% organics removal. And it also explains why we do then see a difference with the additional 10% removal, because here now we're not removing anymore the easily biodegradable acetate, but really 
this fraction of low molecular weight organics that is most probably competing for adsorption sites as has been shown by literature before as well. So with this, we can already understand better the influence of the bulk organics on the adsorption itself. But in our hypothesis, we also raised another question, which is more on the operational side, namely the one of the clogging. And for this, we did another experiment where we actually used granular activated carbon columns, um, three identical columns, where we fed the three different urines, but this time unfiltered to also have other effects apart from absorption, such as biological growth, for example. And then what we did is we fed it top down, let it trickle through, and then just measured the overstand on top of the carbon um, to quantify the clogging. And what you see on the graph is now this water head in centimeters over, over the TAC over time, here shown as number of treated bed volumes to, to account for differences in pump rates. Um, and what we can see is that the stored urine, so the blue one, the untreated urine, it clogs very, very fast. And what we also can see is that removing the easily biodegradable organics, so the 75% organics removal can already mitigate that problem very good. Of course, the 85% uh, removal is still better. It's, we never saw, saw a accumulation or an overstand in the, the time of the experiment there, but also um, removing 75% already helped a lot. So with this, I want to come back to the hypothesis that I stated in the beginning where we said, okay, we need organic removal to absorb pharmaceutical from stored urine. And we identified two problems, one being the competition with bulk organics, the other one being uh, operational issue of clogging. And we were able to, to show that yes, they are indeed a problem if we treat stored urine directly. And that with the easy treatment of organics, let's say we can mitigate only one of them. And by removing then the, the organics um, better or to a, to a bigger extent, we can mitigate both of the problem. And what does that mean for as an implication? So to at least optimally use the carbon for pharmaceutical removal um, in terms of reducing the amount of carbon and not having operational issues, it is advisable to have a pre-treatment regarding organics to use carbon to remove pharmaceuticals. And with this, I'm already done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aurea. That was that was really interesting, and and uh, oh, I was very fascinated to hear all about that. So thanks so much. All right. Um, so I think we'll we'll come back to questions at the end once. And then again, if you have questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat, um, and um, we either Aurea can address them in the chat, or uh, we can we can address them. At, um, all at the end. Um, all right, our next presentation is from Jiaxi Jiang, um, who'll be presenting a feasibility study of powdered activated carbon membrane bioreactor, PAC-MBR, for source-separated urine treatment, a comparison with MBR. Um, Jiaxi Jiang is a PhD candidate in environmental engineering at the University of Technology, Sydney, Australia, with a special interest in environmental biotechnology, sustainable sanitation, source separated urine treatment and resource recovery, membrane process modeling and stimulation, and economic analysis. Uh, welcome, Jiaxi, and uh, you can um, unmute and share your screen. Hi, everyone, and welcome to my presentation. My name is Jesse Jiang from University of Technology, Sydney. I'm going to talk about the feasibility study of product activity carbon membrane bioreactor for salt-separated urine treatment, a comparison with MBR. Firstly, I'll talk about the reason for salt-separating urine from the domestic wastewaters and the importance in removing the micropollutant in wastewater treatment. Then we will look at the experimental design, and finally, we will discuss the results and conclusions of this work. Right, as mentioned by other speakers earlier, Urine contains up to 90% of nitrogen, 80% of phosphorus, and 90% of potassium in only 1% of the total wastewater volume. 
making it an attractive stream for nutrient diversion and recovery. With the help of separating urine from the rest of sewage, we can achieve a complete nutrient recovery, maintain a balance between supply and demand in natural resources, and reduce the energy associated with nutrient removal from wastewater. The presence of microplutons such as pharmaceuticals and personal care products in wastewater stream is an emerging health and environmental concern. Approximately 95% of the drug residue is being discharged by people who are not in the hospital. These compounds are structurally complex and can cause adverse physiological effects on human health at low concentration. However, the current wastewater treatment technologies are not designed to remove these compounds, which lead to many residual pharmaceuticals and helminths in treated influence. Therefore, it's important that we are able to clean off the residual with natural and biological purification method. The aims of the work are to study the effects of PAC additive on bell mass production, removal capacity of six selected microplutons, and membrane falling propensities. The nitrified membrane barrier in this work, functioning as a stabilizer, oxidizes unstable ammonium from the hydrolyzed urine into stable nitrate removes bad smell and reduces solution pH from 9 to 6.2. 2 gram per liter of PAC is also added to MBR at refreshment rate of 1.6% per day to remove microplutons via physical absorption and biodegradation in a single step. Specifically, lab-scale MBR and PAC MBR with effective working volume of 26 liters were operated in parallel to treat hydrolyzed urine which collected from the urine division system at the University of Technology, Sydney. The feed stream constitutes an automatic pH doser. It's designed to achieve a continuous feeding and maintain the pH of sludge mixture at approximately 6.2 during the entire operation period. An air diffuser was placed at the bottom of the bell reactor to maintain the dissolved oxygen level in a range between 4.3 and 4.5 mg per liter. The sludge retention time was set at 62.5 days, and the hydraulic retention time was maintained at 3.5 days. Six representative microplutons were chosen in this work according to their molecular structures and properties, acidity, hydrophobicity of molecular compounds, and likelihood in salt-separated urine. The analyzed liquid samples were pre-concentrated and separated by solid phase extraction, then measured by LCMS. The membrane falling mechanism was evaluated based on four single modules and five combined modules. The simulation between theoretical data and experimental data were performed and fitted in MATLAB based on the falling module equations and the sum of square error. The slide shows the water quality results. On average, 43% of ammonium was converted into nitrate in control MBR, while 48% was biologically oxidized in PAC MBR. This implies that the higher specific space introduced by PAC is more favorable to proliferation of nitrifying bacteria in a carbon deficient environment, thereby enhancing the overall nitrification oxidation rate. The unfavorable nitride accumulation was also mitigated at 2 gram per liter PAC dosage during the system operation because more shelter space was created to protect sensitive nitrified bacteria from losing their activity at the event of sudden change of temperature, pH, toxicity, or nitrogen loading. As compared to the nutrient composition in palmid, since the PAC surface is negatively charged in equal solutions with unpaired electron, Positively charged compounds and ions were fastly absorbed by strong electrostatic attraction, resulting in more favorable absorption of calcium and magnesium in PAC MBR than control MBR. These figures show the COD removal performance over time in MBR with and without PAC dosage. The overall increase in COD removal by 7.4% with the PAC addition indicated that PAC additives were beneficial to effectively remove organic matter and consistently maintain a high quality permit. It was to know that the COD removal rate in PAC and BR increased from 96% to 98% at initial 19 days operation, followed by a decrease in COD removal performance then rebounded to 97% at the end of operation. 
This indicates that the organics were mainly removed by PAC physical absorption rather than biodegradation at the initial stage. In contrast, from day 31, the COD was likely removed through a combination effect of physical absorption and biodegradation. The membrane falling mechanisms are studied in this slide. We can see the K-complete module was the best fitting module causing MBR membrane falling with a minimum SSE value of 0 0.035. Given the value of fitting constant Kc in combined K-complete falling module was greater than Kb, it indicated that the membrane pore blocking lead to the buildup of cake layer on the membrane surface at the early stage of filtration. Membrane falling propensity was further exacerbated as the cake layer developed. The cake blocking becomes the dominant falling module among other falling modules in MBR. The change of transmembrane pressure in MBR at end of operation was 2.3 times higher than that value in PAC MBR where there was no obvious DMP sharp jump in PAC and beyond throughout the experiment, suggesting that no severe irreversible falling was present after adding PAC. This could be explained by absorption of organic fallings onto PAC, which reduced the potential of pollutants deposition on the membrane surface and the formation of thick cake layer. Moreover, the 1.6% of PAC refreshment rate also contributed to the decrease in numbers of organic pollutants in cake layer. Given the fact that continuously adding virgin PAC into the system maximizes the interaction between PAC and activated sludge, therefore reducing the membrane falling propensity from pore blocking or pore constriction caused by particles absorption into the membrane. The removal efficiency of targeted micropollutants in control MBR varies significantly from 41% to 97%. The low removal efficiency of carbon mazepine in control MBR was probably due to its moderate hydrophobicity and strong resistance to biodegradation, resulting in its partial absorption on activated sludge. As compared to control MBR, Greater than 99% removal efficiency was achieved among all targeted microprotons in PAC MBR. This observation was again consistent with literature that the dominating mechanism for removal of targeted hydrophilic compounds in MBR is biodegradation rather than sorption by activated sludge. In conclusion, the proposed PAC MBR system was an ideal approach for complete nutrient recovery at the building level. To add 2 gram per liter of PAC in MBR at 1.6% refreshment rate removed micropollutant via physical absorption and biodegradation in a single step without compromising the system operating stability. Furthermore, it improved organic matter's removal efficiency from 88% to 96% maintained consistent high quality effluent, increased 70% growth of the mean sludge flock size, and promoted more rapid biomass growth. Compared to control MBR, the formation of biological powdered activity carbon over time, while growth of stable microbial film on PAC granular, guarantees greater than 99% removal efficiency among targeted micropollutants. The removal efficiency of carbon mazepine, for instance, was improved from 41% in control MBR to 100% in PAC MBR. Thanks for listening. Any questions? Next will be Anna Kogler. Anna uh, will be presenting Fate of Organic Contaminants in Electrochemical Nitrogen Recovery Processes Treating Urine. Uh, Anna is a PhD student in environmental engineering at Stanford University, working in the Tarpe lab, which we saw earlier. Um, she focuses on designing and evaluating electrochemical nitrogen recovery processes, treating a range of wastewaters and generating multiple products. She is passionate about accelerating implementation and building local capacity, particularly in resource constrained communities. Welcome, Anna. Awesome. Thank you for that introduction. Is everyone seeing my screen? Yes, looks great. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So um, today I'll be talking about the fate of organic contaminants in electrochemical nitrogen recovery processes treating urine. And to one second. 
trying to get my laser pointer. There we go. Okay. Um, so as uh, this community is well aware, um, a circular nitro nitrogen economy in which we recover nitrogen from wastewater for benef beneficial reuse, for example, as a fertilizer, has environmental and economic benefits. Such a circular economy could reduce energy consumption, chemical use, greenhouse gas emissions, and costs associated with both chemical production and wastewater treatment. The system could also improve equity, um, source access, and expand sanitation. We all know that source-separated urine could facilitate such a circular nitrogen economy because it accounts for only 1% of wastewater volume, but contains 80% of wastewater nitrogen. So it's a really nice concentrated stream that we can tap. One technology that you actually heard a little bit about earlier during our lab tour um, that can enable a circular nitrogen economy is electrochemical stripping or ECS. This process selectively recovers ammonia nitrogen just based on charge and so we introduce urine into this first chamber of the system where we electrochemically acidify the urine to uh, mostly generate ammonium ions that can then be removed by transferring to the second chamber. In the second chamber, we electrochemically raise the pH so that we generate ammonia or NH3, which can then volatilize and pass over into our third chamber. There, we trap that ammonia as ammonium sulfate and recover it um, for use, for example, as a fertilizer. So in summary, um, just by taking advantage of the charge of ammonium ions and the volatility of ammonia molecules, we can selectively recover ammonia in the system as a fertilizer. We've demonstrated ECS in a variety of wastewaters, including real urine, and consistently achieved high nitrogen recovery efficiencies of about 90% or above. However, um, like other nutrient removal and recovery technologies, ECS still faces various barriers to implementation. So in this figure, I'm showing the frequency of reporting of several different knowledge gaps throughout literature on nutrient technologies. We see that the most reported gaps are optimization of operating conditions and reactor configuration, as well as understanding underlying process mechanisms. However, today I want to focus on two less commonly reported knowledge gaps, namely byproduct formation and the fate of contaminants. Are really important for electrochemical technologies and for nutrient recovery. Byproduct formation is actually reported as a barrier for 40% of electrochemical. And the fate of contaminants is really important as we're thinking about uh, recovery processes that can produce pure, safe, and marketable products. And so, two questions that tie into these topics are um, what is the relative fate of pharmaceuticals compared to nutrients that are recovered? And to what extent are disinfecting byproducts or DBPs formed, and what is their fate in electrochemical? So as we already heard um, earlier, pharmaceuticals are fairly concentrated in urine because about 65% of pharmaceuticals are excreted in urine, and consumers um, actually perceive pharmaceuticals as a major risk associated with urine drug fertilizer. And so looking over here at the right for a variety of pharmaceuticals and different um, sources of urine, we see a large variation in the concentrations of different pharmaceuticals. So it's really important that we understand um, what is happening with the pharmaceuticals in our nutrient recovery processes. One way to do that is using non-target analysis, which facilitates a broad understanding of pharmaceuticals. This approach involves gathering liquid chromatography, high resolution mass spectrometry data, and then processing that data to find find and group features, which means we're um, picking out compounds that are potentially present in our sample. And then we annotate those features, which means that we assign chemical formulas and chemical structures that might correspond to those features. And then we rank the candidates so that we can tentatively identify compounds that are present and um, semi-quantitatively analyze changes in their concentration. We're using uh, a software or a package called Patroon, um, which is um, an R-based open source um, platform. And so we can use this non-target analysis to um, develop various metrics that help us characterize pharmaceutical behavior. 
one such metric is um, the transformation ratio, which captures the behavior of pharmaceuticals relative to the behavior um, of nutrients. So here, um, looking back at our electrochemical stripping reactor, we can think about the transformation ratio um, defined as the full change in pharmaceutical concentration divided by the full change in nutrient concentration. Define the full change in pharmaceutical concentration as the effluent concentration divided by the influent concentration. So it's essentially a measure of what fraction of the food movement. And for the nutrient, the full change um, is defined as the uh, ammonia concentration in the product divided by the influent ammonia concentration. So that's a measure of how much ammonia is recovered. Then we can um, create these plots called vol volcano plots, which show the significance of the change in the pharmaceutical concentration versus the degree of change. And that analysis allows us to um, start to look at patterns um, of the pharmaceutical behavior relative to ammonia behavior. So we can identify contaminants over here that are concentrated rel relative to nitrogen. So those might be identified as transformation products and constituents that we need to think about in terms of product safety or the safety of the treated urine. And then we can also identify contaminants that are depleted relative to nitrogen. So those are ones that are removed and maybe of less concern um, for product and effluent safety. So in summary, um, this quick introduction to non-target analysis hopefully shows that um, it can enable a broad comparison of pharmaceutical and nutrient feet without having to look at very specific um, pharmaceutical compounds um, and you know, buying all the standards that you need to analyze them. So then let's jump into the second question. To what extent are disinfection byproducts or DDPs formed and what is their fate in electrochemical stripping? Um, looking again back at the electrochemical stripping reactor, um, I just wanna zoom in on the first chamber here. Um, I mentioned earlier that we use an electrochemical um, reaction shown here to acidify the influent urine so that we can facilitate conversion of any ammonia to ammonium and then ultimately remove and recover that. However, there are of course lots of other constituents in urine, for example, chloride ions. These can also be oxidized to chlorine and then react further to hypochlorous acid. And that can then react with various organics in urine to form disinfection byproducts. Um, pose a risk to both humans and the environment because they've been linked to various cancers and other health impacts, as well as negative ecological impacts. And some of the species um, are even regulated in drinking water. So we've quantified um, a whole variety of disinfection byproducts um, to understand what species are forming and whether they're moving throughout the reactor. So looking um, at the formation of um, DDPs. Here I'm showing the concentration of several um, regulated DDPs normalized to the published guideline values for drinking water and looking at the, those concentrations over. And um, this red line indicates the point at which the observed concentrations exist. And we see that there is um, an increasing um, trend in the concentration. So we clearly have um, disinfection byproducts forming, and some of those even exceed the published guidelines. So that suggests that we need to potentially modify our operating conditions or reactor design um, to make sure that we um, mitigate this DDP formation. One promising um, result that we've seen, though, is that if we quantify the concentration of various DDPs in our third chamber, so that's where we recover the product, we actually see that all of those concentrations are below the detection limits. So it seems that these do not contaminate the recovery process. Uh, just to recap, um, we've shown that non-target analysis can enable broad comparison of pharmaceutical and nutrient fate, and um, that DDP formation requires mitigation in electrochemical stripping um, to make sure that our treated urine is safe, but we do generate a product that is DDP free. So hopefully um, this study will help us modify our reactor design and operating conditions um, to mitigate contaminants further 
and um, ultimately develop treatment trains that facilitate um, valorization and safe handling of urine. Um, and just, I'd just like to acknowledge um, some funding sources from Stanford, um, the Tarpe Lab for all of their support, as well as the Mitch Lab here at Stanford, um, we develop methods. Um, thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, again, if you have questions, uh, put them in the chat, and uh, either they can be addressed um, right in the chat or uh, we'll address them right at the end after our fourth presentation which is going to be a video uh pre-recorded video from abdul aziz almantush almantusharisi uh who has sent a pre-recorded presentation titled uh, removal of antibiotics from nitrified real human urine by gac abdul aziz is a phd student at the university of technology sydney who is working on pharmaceuticals removal from human urine by adsorption process. So welcome, Abdulaziz, and uh, we'll get your video uh, going momentarily. Hi, everyone. I am Abdulaziz. I'm a PhD student at, in environmental engineering at University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, my topic today is removal of antibiotics from nitrified real human urine by GAC. There are six main points I would like I would, would like to discuss, which are introduction, research gap, research objective, material method, result and conclusion. Now, let's move on to introduction. First of all, what is the source separated with water stream and how is it important? The source separated with water stream is the one way to separate urine from uh, other source of wastewater because the urine is contain 80% of nitrogen, 50% of phosphor. As you see the diagram, if it is separated the urine stream, it is easy to recycle nitrogen and phosphor and use it as a fertilizer for agriculture. And the benefit of source separated urine also reduce loading of nitrogen uh, of phosphor, reduce energy consumption, reduce greenhouse gas emission from wastewater treatment plant, but still there is one. The problem here is the presence of pharmaceutical in the urine is, uh, is one of the major issue. That means the potential impact of pharmaceutical diurene to environmental and public health can be significant. So the available techniques to remove the pharmaceutical from urine, for example, membrane separation, advanced oxidation process, electrodialysis, all, all these techniques are expensive and takes time. So the technique used in this study uh, is by uh, adsorption process by granular acid carbon because it's simple liberation mode and inexpensive and can be regenerated. The main objective of this work is to investigate the, per the pertinence of GAC adsorption in removing antibiotics, investigating the mechanism of antibiotic under different operation parameters, such as particle size, adsorbent mass, and flow rate, and to predict, and to, to predict antibiotics removal by artificial neural network. The, main, the next point is the material method. As you can see here, the table one is the GAC properties in different particle size. There are three different particle size, which are 425, 600, 1000 micrometer. And table two here is the composition of nitrified urine before and after GAC. And there are there are here three antibiotics selected in this study, which are sulfimetaxazole, which are abbreviated as SMX, uh, sulfadiazine, which are abbreviated as SDZ, and sulfimetaxazine, which are abbreviated as SMZ, and they are selected based on uh, forming high percent of their extraction from human urine. 
this slide show that st the stomatic diagram of GSC column. If you look at this photo, you can see that the hydrolyzed urine color is tend to light yellow after nitrate urine, and then tend to transparent after GSC column. I will show I will show you the result. The the first parameter is particle size. The the impact of particle size of GC into uh, antibiotics. There are three there are three figures here, which is which describe the the removal rate of pharmaceuticals against time. As you said before, uh, in this study there are in this study selected three different particle size which are 425, 600, and 1,000 micrometer. So the both uh, breakthrough point and saturation time are defined in when the final concentration of antibiotics reach 5% and 95% of final concentration respectively. So in this figure, as you can see, the saturation time here is happening after around 16 hours. Uh, however, at large, larger particle size, the saturation time is happening here after uh, 10 hours. Uh, so that's mean the particle size, the smaller particle size uh, for breakthrough point and saturation time increase for all antibiotics because because of the shorter diffusion path for antibiotics, leading to increased antibiotics. Remission and GAC bars. The second parameter is the impact of fluorate. As you can see here, three fluorates have selected, which are 0 0.06, uh, 0 0.12, and, and 0 0.18 liter per hour. So when fluorate increase, the the breakthrough and saturation times. Uh, decrease for all antibiotics. Uh, this is expected because uh, increased mass loading in the colon of, of antibiotics in the colon, uh, which leads to faster saturation. Uh, the third parameter is the bed high. There are uh, three bed high uh, mass of adsorbent selected, uh, which are 0 0.5 gram, 0 0.8, and 1.5 gram. Uh, as you can as you can see here, at uh, when increase the mass of adsorbent to 1.5, the breakthrough the breakthrough point and saturation time is increased for all, all for all antibiotics, and also uh, uh, lead to a higher volume of urine treatment. Here, this slide show the antibiotics removal modeling by NNN. Uh, as you can see the figures here, the experimental data match well with the predicted data for the removal for the removal efficiency of uh, all uh, of all antibiotics. Here is conclusion. So the break, the breakthrough point and saturation time are affected by flow rate, particle size, and mass of absorbent in the column uh, in the GSC column. And the faster breakthrough, breakthrough time and saturation happen when the when the operational condition um, are applied using less mass of adsorbent and higher flow rate, also leading to reduce urine treatment. And the NN model used in this study are able to product quite accurately, matching more than 97% with the experimental data and predicting data of, of all antibiotics. Alrighty, thank you, Abdul Aziz. Um, so we do have a couple questions, and we have um, uh, just a moment, maybe to to address a few of them. Um, there were a couple of questions in the chat uh, for Jiashi. Um, one from Aurea. Uh, oh, that one got answered. Uh, there's one from Rich Earth as well, which was, could you tell us? Uh, how many grams of PAC were needed per liter of urine treated over the course of the experiment? 
Um, they weren't sure, um, weren't able to understand that from the dosing and the refresh rate. If, right. So the initial dosage. Uh, oh, I amount, think you're muted. Uh, uh, right. So can you hear me now? Yes, now? we hear you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, right. You. So oh, the sorry. initial concentration, the initial PSA dosage concentration was at two gram per liter, which means in every one, one liter of the um, sludge mixture, we dose two gram of the PSA powder in it. Then we also introduce a refreshment rate because as time goes by, uh, we were not, we're gonna face in the aging problem. Uh, of the PAC powder. So every day we want to replace 1.6% uh, of the total amount of the PAC in our system. To do so, we can keep our, we can always keep the virgin PAC present in our system so that we can ha have the combined uh, biodegradation and also the physical absorption happens simultaneously to remove the pharmaceuticals, either from the physical absorption or from the biodegradation. So that's a sort of the, that's a sort why we wanna uh, introduce a refreshment rate as well to replace uh, the aged PAC powder. Right, so the, Question? I think they have a follow-up. Uh, how many liters of the urine per day? For our current reactors, the lab scale reactors, our working volume is 26 liters. And we have like uh, HRT, which is a hydraulic retention time at 3.5 days. Thank you so much. All right, I think that all the other questions uh, that I saw have been addressed already in the chat. So thank you to everyone uh, who both asked asked questions and and for the presenters for responding there. Um, and again, if you have further questions, um, I think there'll be there'll be ways to reach out to folks um, as well.